My name is Janae Bonsu. I'm happy to be here. I am a PhD student, hopefully will become candidate over the summer, uh, at UIC in social work. And uh, I'm a grad student researcher with the Policing in Chicago Research Group, um, I'll refer to as PCRG for short. Um, so the PCRG is a collaborative, um, community-engaged project at UIC that brings grad student and faculty researchers uh, in uh, conversation and collaboration with community-based organizations uh, to lend research support uh, on, on campaigns and, and social movement work related to racialized policing. Uh, and so I transparently am a member of one of the organizations uh, that PCRG has been working with, Black Youth Project 100, or BYP 100 for short. Uh, and so BYP 100, along with Organized Communities Against Deportations, OCAD, uh, have been co-leading a campaign to expand sanctuary in Chicago since 2017, January 2017. What do I mean, expand sanctuary? So uh, BYP 100 being a black-led organization uh, and OCAD being a, uh, a Latinx-led organization of, composed of uh, primarily undocumented folks um, found solidarity amid uh, you know, the kind of political context, uh, Trump kind of attacking sanctuary cities, um, threatening federal funding to uh, cities that declare themselves sanctuaries. Um, we found solidarity in the fact that uh, police, local police in many ways, act as a, an entry point or gateway funnel, if you will, to both the mass deportation and mass incarceration machines, right? And so uh, we kind of teamed up together to say, what would it look like for, um, for cities who, to go beyond sanctuary as this um, bare minimum misnomer in some ways, um, to, to really not just look at how uh, policing impacts un, uh, undocumented immigrants, but also um, US born, black and brown folks who are impacted by racialized policing. Uh, and so uh, aside from anecdotal experiences of our organizational members and community members, the issue of gang policing came up in a couple of ways uh, throughout this campaign. One is through the language of the Welcoming City Ordinance here in Chicago or Chicago Sanctuary City Policy that has explicit language uh, excluding people who are um, alleged verified gang members from protection from, uh, from ICE, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. Uh, and then in this kind of perfect storm of events, uh, an OCAD member, uh, Wilmer Catalan Ramirez, was picked up in an ICE raid um, as he was falsely identified as uh, not only just being a gang member, but being a member of two rival gangs. How can that be possible? Um, and uh, you know his arm was broken. It was it it, it was a, it was a terrible thing, right? And so you know it, it led to many questions about well, how was he identified? Um, you know what was the criteria? How many people are you know in this database? Just a lot of questions that guided PCRG's uh, kind of investigation into this opaque, obscure uh, database, right? And so uh, over the summer of 2017. We uh, submitted a series of FOIA requests, conducted uh, some qualitative interviews with people uh, directly affected, uh, gang researchers, uh, attorneys, uh, former CPD officials, did some archival research and kind of pieced together some pieces of the puzzle to you know, try to figure out what, what this thing is, right? And so I will preface this presentation by saying that I do not purport to know everything about what we are calling the, the gang database, right? But I'm here to share um, what we have been able to piece together, what I do know, um, and you know, open to, to dialogue about it. So first, just start with the basic question. What is not just the gang database, but a gang, gang database? Um, so long before computers were so widespread, uh, individual police officers and gang intelligence units uh, kept actual intelligence files on gangs and gang members. Um, but the introduction of computers and the you know, technology revolution uh, has enabled more systematic information gathering, uh, you know, vastly more powerful search capacity and practically instantaneous retrieval uh, you know, at the tips of your fingers, as you can see here in this picture. Um, 
to, to hold such data. So broadly defined, a gang database is an information system that includes suspected or confirmed uh, members of street gangs. And so, you know, the trend is clearly on the wave of or in the direction of more databases and access to information on more gang members, whether it's through a centralized database or uh, diverse decentralized databases. And so even though, you know, in the, in the media, particularly if you've been um, following, we've been referring to it as the gang database, and it makes it sound like this just standalone, you know, system that is only comprised of gang-related data, but that's actually not true. So in Chicago, just thinking about context, Chicago is infamous for you know, gun, gun violence, right? Uh, much of which is attributed to gangs. Um, and so it's in this context that um, you know, in the late 1990s, after a $40 million development process with the Oracle Corporation, the Chicago Police Department created uh, what's called CLEAR, or the Citizen and Law Enforcement Analysis and Reporting System, and rolled it out in 2002. So CLEAR is where uh, CPD houses all of its gang-related data, and it is not a, uh, just one database. It's a huge data warehouse that's, you know, in a way kind of comprised of databases. It's like a database of databases, if you will, um, or a system of relational databases. And so the CLEAR system uh, collects uh, a lot of data. So you see that camera here on the slide. Um, that feeds into, into CLEAR, um, you know, CLEAR can, is the system where, you know, an officer can check driver's licenses, uh, you know, communicate with other officers, look at outstanding arrests, addresses, so much data feeds into this system, uh, and the technology allows officers to not just submit queries, but then organize them into, you know, accessible text charts and, and map formats. Um, so these, uh, databases allow law enforcement officials to easily cross-reference available information, uh, analyze crime patterns using uh, geographic information systems, um, etc. So, uh, again, one of the questions that kind of guided our uh, look into this is, how do people get in? Like, what's the criteria? How can uh, an officer, you know, deem someone as a gang member? And so the, the criteria to determine gang affiliation is almost entirely unrelated to criminal conduct um, and, you know, even to active participation in gang activities. To the contrary, most uh, gang units, including CPD, rely on criteria that are predominantly non-criminal uh, and relate to how a person looks, acts, who a person's with, uh, what a person wears. Uh, the top of the list of, of criteria based on CPD correctives is self-admission. Uh, I can poke holes in this uh, later, but just for the sake of time. Self-admission, you know, wearing distinctive emblems, tattoos, uh, symbols, uh, identification by an officer who has special intelligence on the subject of gangs. And it's not listed here, but also uh, corroboration or intelligence from uh, someone who's provided uh, information to police before, i.e. An, uh, an informant, uh, can also feed into this criteria. So uh, how is it then documented? Individuals are recorded in the CLEAR system through uh, two primary ways. Uh, one, there's an annual audit, a gang audit, that happens in every single police district, um, wherein the police gather information that includes gang name, faction names, territorial borders, faction size, conflicts, organizational level, alleged violence, um, and some information that feeds into uh, these audits are taken from social media. Um, there have been uh, court cases uh, based on you know, some of the researchers that I've talked to where there have been pages and pages of you know, Facebook posts that have been printed out, um, you know, surveillance on YouTube, et cetera, that feed into this intelligence. Um, also intelligence gathered during arrests or other interactions, uh, police interactions with individuals. Um, and these data are and put it into uh, the, either a gang arrest card application or investigatory stop report database. Again, two different databases within this larger clear warehouse. So let's talk about predictive policing for a second. Um, in our investigation into you know, what is this database, we actually started looking at uh, the strategic subjects list, uh, which you might have heard about before. Uh, at the time, 
uh, because we were not getting any um, responses from CPGs uh, for our FOIA requests, uh, strategic subject list data was all we had to go on uh, to kind of make an inference or, or guesstimate how many people are, are tagged as gang affiliated in, in the city of Chicago. So what is the strategic subjects list? So a large part of CPD's overall strategy for policing gang activity is through predictive policing, which uses software packages and mathematical algorithms to target geographic hotspots and identify uh, individuals expected to be involved in uh, violent crime. And so CPD's most well-known predictive policing tool is the tr strategic subjects list, or the SSL. Um, it's just another compilation of mostly gang members. There's a, uh, a column or a, you know, a tab in the SSL that uh, identifies folks who are gang affiliated. Uh, it, supposedly now gang affiliation isn't a part of the algorithm anymore, but that, that tab is still there and it, it exists. So the department is using network analysis um, to generate this highly controversial SSL of people deemed at risk of either becoming victims or perpetrators of violent crime. And um, you know this concept of network analysis is is controversial and uh, you know kind of derived from the research of someone named Andrew Papakristos who grew up in Chicago. Uh, he and a colleague of his, uh, Christopher Wildman, conducted a study of a high crime neighborhood on Chicago's West Side and found that over 40% of uh, gun homicide victims in the community uh, belonged to a network of people who had been arrested together and comprised just a mere 4% of the population, um, suggesting that you know, much can be learned about crime by examining the company that people keeps, essentially. Uh, so that is how uh, we suspect that people who are not actually in gangs but have a, cousin, brother, friend, uh, or other associate end up you know, being labeled as gang affiliated, which of course is uh, problematic. Um, so you know, this kind of birthed what's called a custom notifications process, um, a program rather, where uh, people who have a certain score in the SSL um, are uh, offered social services uh, to people in danger while preventing likely shooters from picking up a gun, which is a fair idea in theory, uh, but does it work? So uh, a report from the RAND Corporation concluded that the custom notification process actually saved zero lives, um, which is unfortunate, uh, or not, depending on your views. But uh, the overall list of hundreds of likely shooters generated um, wasn't used as intended, and uh, one, one result that the study did find was that it identified people who were more likely to be arrested, which essentially served as a way to find suspects after the fact. So gang experts that I spoke with as part of this research um, also asserted that predictive policing produces, quote, way too many false positives. And so while gangs are often blamed for gun violence in Chicago, over two thirds of the people who are identified as gang affiliated on the SSL, um, which is, a, 65,000 people um, have no documented arrests for violent offenses or unlawful use of a weapon, which raises really important questions about how thousands of people on this database have never been arrested for the principal activities that CPD considers as gang related. Uh, so let's talk about scope a little bit. Uh, how big is this thing? Uh, so information that was finally obtained through FOIA requests, um, not submitted by us, but someone, a journalist student at Northwestern, showed that uh, there's over 128,000 people in the CLEAR database that have been uh, labeled as gang affiliated. And at least 70% of these people are black, 25% uh, are Hispanic. And even though 128,000 is a massive number, it is very likely an, uh, an underestimate because that number does not include people who are under 18, um, and citing you know, privacy laws, uh, you know, the department declines to release information on juveniles, which is you know, a, a major component of gangs. Uh, there has been some new information released um, through ProPublica, uh, and those raw data spreadsheets are available online, um, and in some preliminary analysis that uh, we'll likely publish in the, in the probably beginning of June, shows that uh, there are, based on the date entered, um, thousands of people under the uh, age of 18 uh, entered as early as age 11 uh, that are in this database. Um, 
And so this graph here shows the number of cases entered per year. And you can see between uh, 2005 and 2017, especially, um, the database grew very quickly. And these are new cases entered per year. Um, so the, the sharp rise, particularly in the last several years, coincides with uh, Superintendent Gary MacArthur's leadership, um, who uh, in a recent article attributed the increase to you know, his shifting more officers to beat patrols, to increase interactions with the public, um, and also ordering the gang audits starting in 2012. So you see a sharp increase there. Um, so this here, I'm showing some overlaps in uh, law enforcement agencies. Um, so the gang database is a part of a broader shift to uh, advanced strategies for collecting and analyzing and sharing data between local and federal law enforcement agencies. Um, one piece that kind of uh, joined the PCRG's project on the gang database and another project that we'd been working with the Arab American Action Network on uh, centers around uh, what we're calling the fusion centers or the crime prevention and information center. Um, and it's through uh, CPIC that manages CPD surveillance equipment, uh, maintains the clear database, and also facilitates data sharing with uh, state and federal law enforcement agencies. So the FBI, the Department of uh, Homeland Security, uh, Illinois State Police, uh, Cook County Sheriff's Office, I heard Cook County, someone from Cook County in here today. Um, they, uh, and other agencies assign officers to help staff the CPIC. Uh, and these agencies all have direct access to CPD data, which of course uh, includes a, a database. So I think what is most important to, to me as uh, the, the organizer side of the hat that I've been playing in this, uh, in this campaign is the, the problems with the database. So uh, I named this talk the data-driven data criminalization uh, because you know criminalization is the process by which um, you know someone is deemed criminal um, through actions and behaviors that are not necessarily uh, a crime, right? And so, in building a gang database, the government is collecting extensive information on thousands of individuals without any underlying criminal predicate. Um, so, gang membership itself is not illegal, right? And thus doesn't qualify um, as in uh, underlying criminal predicate or, or justified maintenance of intelligence information. But you know, w whether you agree with that or not, um, it is the fact that uh, gang databases um, are arbitrary, inaccurate, and over-inclusive. So it's not clear whether, um, well, it is clear, actually, that law enforcement agencies don't uh, always follow even their own criteria. Thus, databases you know, include people who were never gang members. Um, uh, as well as those who joined and then quit gangs. I had a couple of interviews with folks who are in their 40s, and um, you know, one person in particular is doing anti-violence work right now, and is still profiled in, through traffic stops and asked if he's still you know, a member of a particular gang. Um, so these levels don't go anywhere. Um, and because documented gang affiliation is a, a determining factor in where a person is housed when they're incarcerated, you know, mislabeling can fuel violence uh, in jails and prisons. Uh, and police uh, superintendent Eddie Johnson even said himself that you know they, CPD recognizes that some people may be misidentified. Um, the reality is we don't know how many people are misidentified, as there has been no transparency. Um, but problems with the gang database go beyond just misidentifications. Um, there's also some potential due process violations, as individuals aren't notified when they've been placed in the database, um, and even when they are, or if they are, um, they learn that you know they've been unjustifiably included. Uh, there's no established procedure by which they can contest that label um, or ensure that their records are removed. So. Uh, because due process doesn't currently exist in Chicago's system, uh, the accuracy of gang intelligence is highly questionable and, and dependent on you know, value judgments uh, of those who control the, the database. Um, and the sharing of inaccurate data that can have you know, a harmful effect on an individual is really at the heart of what makes the database uh, potentially unconstitutional. Um, and gang designations, regardless of its accuracy, can have adverse consequences for someone's interactions with employers, uh, schools, and even landlords, as background checks are routine in employment and housing application processes, um, which leads just to some consequences of being listed in the database. Um, once you are listed, you're more likely to, be, uh, to have increased police attention and harassment. Um, 
as these systems you know, seek to make identification information more routinely accessible for use during traffic and, uh, and other police stops, your uh, target has kind of grown bigger uh, on your back. Uh, also, immigrants who are alleged to be involved with gangs are top immigration priorities to DHS. And this is true whether or not they have criminal convictions, uh, because DHS is targeting them on uh, these allegations alone. Um, in Chicago specifically, gang affiliation uh, impacts bail decisions. Um, you know, people who are lab labeled as gang affiliated are not eligible for cash bonds or I bonds here um, and receive relatively higher bonds. Um, and lastly, gang involvement has resulted in targeted raids, as I mentioned with the, the case of Wilmer Catalan Ramirez, uh, detention and deportation for immigrants. Um, and to the point of uh, employment opportunities and professional licenses, that, that data is still um, more on the anecdotal side. We've had a couple of people um, you know, say that in an application process, they've been denied, been told they've been denied because of um, alleged gang membership status. And so all of this to say um, that we're at a point now where this issue has gotten a lot more attention. Um, when the Tracked and Targeted report was released back in February, um, we had a community-based uh, teach-in wherein a couple of uh, folks from the Office of the Inspector General were present. Um, and one of our recommendations was for a third-party kind of auditor situation to look into this database to, um, to get some of the answers to the questions that we weren't uh, able to ascertain. And so uh, recently, uh, back in March, the OIG uh, announced formally its, uh, its plan to evaluate the, uh, both the uh, gang database and strategic subjects list, which is, uh, you know, I think a, a victory that, you know, grassroots organizations that have been working on this issue can claim, because um, we've been pushing on this issue for the past year now. And I'm glad that it's finally getting some, some traction. Uh, there's also some state level policy proposals that have uh, that come out uh, recently. Um, the campaign is, uh, you know, mulling over litigation strategies and others, um, all of which are being pushed forward by grassroots organizers in Chicago. Um, there's a website that you can follow for, um, one, to read the tracked and targeted report, uh, and also to keep up to date on the happenings of the campaign uh, at www.erasedatabase.com. And that is the extent of, uh, of what I have. So open to questions and discussions. Yeah, uh, has the database ever been uh, hacked and, and dumped out into the public the way like so many other databases of personal records have been? Um, is there danger of that? Well, I mean, the, the closest we've gotten to that is, you know, the, the data that uh, has been made available through FOIA. Um, so I mentioned um, ProPublica earlier. Uh, so some of the data that we're still digging into um, I wish I had the uh, the link, but some of the data that we're s still digging into is uh, is available through that, and it's, it's there's still a lot missing. Um, but it has you know columns like date first arrested, um, you know the the districts that uh, that folks were arrested in, um, you know just age. There, I mean there's a lot of missing data too, but there hasn't been like a thorough you know hack of this data and that's part of the problem. It's been so obscure for so long um, and even you know after you know several FOIA requests that we we still only have like a, a slice of you know what's out there. So short answer is no. There was actually a question in the doc about FOIA requests uh, and what they are. Oh I Wow, thanks for that question. Um, <laughs> FOIA stands for Freedom of Information Act, and so FOIA requests are, um, you know, or the Freedom of Information Act is basically uh, a law that, you know, allows the public access to, um, to, yeah, data that can be made public. So you can submit a FOIA request to, um, to agencies like Chicago Police Department, Chicago Public Schools, uh, you know, ICE. Uh, yeah, so you can basically submit a request to a government agency for information um, that you are interested in. Um, and, you know, it's not always a guarantee that you'll get that information. Um, some of the responses that we've gotten from CPD is that, uh, you know, the, this is a burdensome request or overly burdensome request that we can't feel or, you know, something like that. Uh, but yes, that is in short what FOIA is. 
There's a question on here that has an asterisk, so I'm going to ask it. Um, what are the tools that are used and what skills are needed to help? That is a good question. Um, so the tools question is, uh, I don't really have a straightforward answer because we don't have much to, to go on um, beyond the data that we've been able to get through FOIA. Um, we're hoping that the OIG investigation, Office of Inspector General uh, evaluation, will bring to light more of the, uh, you know, kind of obscure questions that we haven't been able to answer. So I actually am not sure, um, <laughs> you know, what what skills really are needed. Um, yeah, if, if you can go to ProPublica and, and have some data analysis skills and, you know, can make sense of, um, you know, those spreadsheets, if that's your thing, um, then, you know, I encourage you to do that. But, yeah, we're still kind of just like trying to piece, piece things together. Hi, I love your idea of the third party um, looking at the database, uh, auditing. <clears throat> Have you approached some of the uh, large audit firms? No, we haven't. And I, I'm not sure if there's really a, a need for, um, you know, an additional outside auditor um, outside of OIG at this point. Um, I, and in, it, in the in meetings we have had with OIG uh, uh, so far, you know, they've said that they can try to make some um, data available intermittently. You know, o overall they said that their evaluation will take about a year, but we're hoping that they can, uh, in the meantime, in between time, as they learn things, publish, um, you know, smaller smaller things, you know, before 2019. Um, but you know, as OIG does have um, uh, any any request that they make of uh, the Chicago Police Department, CPD is required to or beholden to, to fulfill that request, right? And I'm not sure any other outside auditor quite has that power, so I think OIG is our best bet to, you know, looking into this thing. So hopefully we can get, you know, more answers sooner than later. I um, mean, OIG has been doing, uh, I think, a good job with due diligence of not just um, looking into the department itself, but they've been holding um, community, like, public hearings to hear for, directly from people who have been um, impacted, and so I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, what they come up with this evaluation. There's another question uh, with an asterisk. Uh, using software to enhance policing seems to be a win. You seem to be against it. In retail, what reality-based system would you build instead of the current one to reduce gang membership violence and the deportation of violent, undocumented immigrants? That's a good question. Well, um, I look to some other cities that um, have been able to function without a so um, thinking about uh, like in Portland, Oregon, for example, uh, they did have a, a, a database or wh whether it was centralized or decentralized like Chicago's is, they had a, a, a you know, intelligence system to track gang members um, and they were finding some of, some of the similar adverse consequences that I had mentioned earlier. Um, and they stopped making gang designations, like they stopped that practice. Um, and somehow, their police department is still standing. Somehow, those officers are still able to do their jobs. Um, and so, you know, it's a, kind of this question of, you know, is this law enforcement tool, uh, is, is the, does the use of it outweigh uh, the, the potential violations of people's rights? Are, are there other ways to kind of um, investigate crimes without knowing someone's alleged or confirmed gang affiliation? Uh, I think that's an important question. And some cities outside of Portland um, have said no, that that's, you know, and they, they found other answers, so. I just have like a, a comment on uh, the wording of that, the deportation of violent undocumented immigrants. Um, undocumented is the correct term to use, not illegal. And um, it just makes it, uh, there's a negative connotation to that where the people who are in gangs are undocumented immigrants. There are other people who are involved in gangs that are from the U.S. Hey, so I work for the county, but I'm in the IT department. Uh, I know that uh, 
so I was the, wondering. The, <laughs> so, the, so the judges used, uh, I looked this up, uh, public safety assessment score, which is based on like nine factors to determine whether or not somebody's uh, good to go with bond, with like an I bond, right? And I think gang affiliation isn't on there. But then I was thinking like maybe the state's attorney would bring it up or something like that in bond court. Is that, um, does, do you know if the state's attorney gets information straight from this database or would they get that uh, a different way? And then do they, is that, how often is that considered in bond court? I learned about um, the whole I bond situation, like, uh, you know, gang affiliation uh, disqualifying you from uh, being able to get an I bond from CPD directives. Uh, like, in that, that's just like on their website if you dig uh, deep enough. But it, it, it doesn't say whether uh, the uh, state's attorney has direct access to the database, but it, it only makes sense that they would, right? Otherwise, I'm not sure how that would be able to work in bond court. But you know, I, I want to just be clear, uh, uh, careful about you know what assertions I make. But that would be my inference. I think also the suburban police departments of so the 135 municipalities within Cook County all have access to clear also. Yeah, I mean, you know, CPD in encourages law enforcement agencies to apply for access to clear, right? So, um, yeah, th there's no um, kind of list somewhere that says, uh, here's all the agencies that have access to clear, but being that they're like essentially advertising <laughs> agencies to apply, uh, yeah, I, it would make sense. So for question six, uh, you mentioned consequences of the database, but I'm wondering how people are receiving information. Uh, I'm not sure if by information you mean how are people learning that they're in the database. The answer is no, people aren't notified <laughs> that they're in the database. Most of the time, um, you don't learn that you're, you've been identified as a gang member until it's too late, like until you're in a criminal court, until you're in a deportation proceeding, until um, you know, you get denied this job. Like it, it's it's not until uh, uh, that consequence happens that you learn about this designation, right? Which is uh, one of the b the big issues that we've uh, kind of been putting forth is this: um, if you're not notified, then you don't have a chance to say, "Look, well, hey, no, that's actually wrong," right? So, yeah, that's that's part of the problem. Maybe I missed it, but is there a difference between confirmed and suspected members of gangs or member of a gang? That is a great question. Um, so I, the criteria that I mentioned earlier uh, is, it, it looks straightforward, but it, it is kind of amorphous. So um, even if, if someone self-admits, according to CPD, that they uh, are a member of a gang, um, there's no burden of proof, if you will, uh, no, no evidence that has to be provided that that admission happened. So someone like Wilmer, like I mentioned earlier, it was documented that he admitted to being a member of, of one of these gangs, when in, re in actuality he didn't. So, um, but there are, <laughs> and I don't want to stand up here and, and act like there are no actual members of gangs in Chicago. That's not true. There are plenty of gang members in Chicago, right? Um, and that will admit that they're in a gang and you know whatever. Um, so I, I make that distinction to you know. To highlight that yes, gang members are a thing, but also you know just because uh, you know an officer says that you know their someone's gang membership was corroborated by th this expert or that they self-admitted or that they have a four-corner hustler tattoo doesn't necessarily mean that it's true, right? Um, so that is what makes it alleged. Um, well, mine is not so much a question, but um, I guess it's going to kind of put in. In context, well, I was gonna answer because I'm on the database actually, and I'm on there because when I was in high school, um, I was at a daytime party. I was a, I was a senior in high school. There was a daytime party, and the, the the daytime party was raided. Everybody left. It was five of us walking back to the bus stop. Two of them were were gang members. Two people that uh, that lived in my neighborhood. We were all heading back. We got pulled over. They threw one of them had weed. Threw it on the floor. They put the weed on all of us. I was a minor, so they took me in. Um, they, they took me into the old school, the one that was on 35th and Wallace. My mom came and got me, and that was it. You know, they did the, the documentation, everything. Because I was with them, they put me down. I've never, I'd never admitted, I've never been in a gang in my life. To this day, I'm a documented gang member. And when I go no to Mexico and I come back, work. like I visit family, I, I get red flagged by DHS. That's a, 
well, not great example, because that is not a great thing that happened, yeah. but it is yeah. <laughs> exemplary of, of how network analysis works. Um, so uh, yeah, that's really unfortunate that, that happened. Hi, so I started typing my question actually. Um, but so what is your alternative then? Should they scrap the database entirely or should they collect data in a more refined manner? And I'm starting to wonder if it's really an issue with the database or the officers who are putting the data in like incorrectly or not appropriately interacting with people to provide accurate data as well, because it could be th data collection methods as well. So is it really a question of scrapping the database or is it a question of training the officers so that they're not targeting certain groups and that bias is reflected in the data? Thank you for asking that question. The answer will vary depending on who you asked. So since you asked me, um, I, <laughs> my, so I uh, uh, preface this again by saying that I, I am both a researcher and organizer in this work, right? Um, and so, you know, BYP 100, Organized Communities Against Deportations, Mi Gente, all the other organizations, whether it's a, uh, you know, uh, legal support, union, whatever. Um, the goal of this campaign is to not make a more perfect database, um, but to to challenge the idea of its its use in the first place, um, to get us to a place where we don't need to use it, right? Um, so, my my opinion is, or, or, or what I would love to see is for Chicago to discontinue use of the gang database. I do not believe that collecting information on gang designation um, is a necessary function um, of you know daily. You know, CPD officer. And that, and that is my opinion, um, and th that is what I know is the stated goal of the campaign. As as you might have gathered from the uh, URL that I shared, erase the database.com. Like we don't want the database anymore. Um, but if you ask other kind of advocates that have you know recently been speaking up on this issue, uh, yeah, their goal is for a more perfect data, uh, database. If you can just purge the, the, the data on people who have been inaccurately or misidentified, you know, if we can just get tighter on, you know, the burden of proof for putting people in the database, then everything will be okay. If we can just go down from 128,000 to just 50,000 gang members, all will be right with the world. That's them. I have my opinion, right? Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, opinions vary on that. Okay, uh, with me being a person that was uh, in a situation where I had to clear my record as well as getting the branding of a gang off my standings or my status, uh, have you ever dealt with a person that actually had to clear their status in the midst of gaining sovereignty, national sovereignty? Because there are a people that do have national sovereignty and national citizenship where there aren't any laws that actually attain to them or their person, but they have to go through a process to get themselves cleared to attain that citizenship. Have you ever dealt with a, sit, a situation like that in the database? No, not directly. I think the closest thing that to that that we've had to deal with, uh, when I say we, um, so uh, attorneys with the MacArthur Justice Center at Northwestern University, um, they uh, have been representing uh, Wilmer that I, I had referenced earlier. And so through that case, uh, CPD did have, they ultimately admitted that they had um, misidentified him, right? And there's still uh, issue or ambiguity around actually removing him because uh, the clear database is this kind of like hosh posh of different databases or, uh, and many different queries. It's unclear, like, it's not like a straightforward thing to just like take somebody's name out of the database, right? Um, and so like that is, a, is an ongoing thing, but we haven't had to deal with um, the, the specific situation that you're talking about, but you know, are in the midst of um, trying to figure out what it, what, it, what it means and looks like to actually clear someone's name um, of that designation, at which, you know, it's, it's proving to be a difficult process. Thank you so much. Thank you.